it's quite clear that a, a good portion of the world and a growing portion of the world uh, not just view the United States as dangerous, but they view it as uh, not serious. Right? How can a country be serious? How can a, 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 a nation that says that it is the uh, leader of the free world be taken seriously when it is backing what Israel is doing, when it is contemplating long-range missile strikes on Russia via its proxy in Ukraine, which Russia continuously says would be a direct confrontation and lead to a direct war, which then would probably lead to nuclear war. Like, like how could a how could a governing system be taken seriously when it is doing these things? Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I have the great pleasure of talking to a fellow YouTuber. I've got with me Denny Haifong, an independent journalist and geopolitical analyst. And I'm sure a lot of you know him because he, Denny, also covers a lot and a lot of um, geopolitical events and US events with very important guests like Scott Ritter or. Uh, Pepe Escobar, uh, I've seen on your on your show and and others. And Danny is one of the people who does who does the good work and and really goes down deep into discussions with with the analysts that he hosts and gives an al analysis himself. So I really wanted to talk to him and know more about his outlook on world politics. Danny, welcome. Thanks so much. It's good to be here, Pascal. Danny, I was wondering about you quite a lot, and because you you also have a very engaged uh, approach towards doing journalism and and especially covering China, Asia, Asia Pacific, could you tell us a little bit more, like where are you coming from? Um, what's your story, and why did you end up covering international politics so much? Well, to make a long story short. I became uh, deeply involved in anti-war politics from an activist perspective circa 2011, 2012, when the Obama administration in the United States was engaged in leading a NATO bombing campaign in Libya and then was moving towards Syria. I became very disillusioned when I was 18 years old. I voted for Barack Obama and believed that he was the hope and change that we needed. Or even if I didn't necessarily believe that, I was bamboozled into uh, at least uh, covering my eyes and just uh, moving throughout life without paying attention. But as I noticed that in the United States, conditions weren't getting better for people. They weren't getting better for my family. They weren't getting better for the people that I grew up around. Uh, the working class people continue to suffer, continue to see their conditions deteriorate. I also noticed that the U.S., was accelerating its war footing everywhere. And over the course of the years after the Libya bombings, it was quite clear that there was a continuity in U.S. foreign policy that had as its core agenda the dismemberment and destruction of the two rising powers to the east, Russia and China. And as somebody who comes from a background, a product of war myself, where uh, my father was... Uh, in the Vietnam War, he was drafted. He spent two years in Vietnam, two years that he despised, that he was always very angry about. And uh, the fact that my mother is herself Vietnamese, although no connection to the war or they didn't meet there, but they met in the United States. And, you know, her experience, although she would never articulate it to a large degree, it's quite clear that her family was exposed to Agent Orange. And knowing that the region of Asia has been under the gun of the United States' empire, I, I believe that this new Cold War drive, this uh, drive to contain both Russia and China, really inspired me to try to understand what exactly is going on here in this particular historical moment. Because when uh, my parents were experiencing the uh, wrath of uh, the U.S. war machine in Vietnam. That was a period where the U.S. was an, the unquestionable hegemon. Now we've entered a period, and this is what I began to learn, is we've entered a period where the United States is actually losing its grip on hegemonic power, on 
empire. And that is why China and Russia find themselves in the crosshairs of the war machine now. And the stakes of this are incredibly high. We're seeing it in Ukraine. We're seeing it in the Asia Pacific. We're seeing it in West Asia. And all of these flashpoints, the potential for a great power confrontation as uh, the U.S. national security uh, strategy document, uh, to paraphrase it, a great power competition, they say. But we're really at the precipice of a great power confrontation, the likes of which we've never seen in human history. Uh, so with all that said, the level of destruction that we see in the world today could get that much worse. And so it really has been over the past decade or so since 2014, since China launched its Belt and Road Initiative, since the coup in Ukraine, uh, since the United States decided to occupy a third of Syria. I can go on and on and on. All of these wars, conflicts, coups, uh, devastating U.S. military and foreign policies have uh, in injected in me the uh, deep need to spread a message of peace and also to spread a message of understanding because one of the ways in which the United States' elite, it's the neocons, the foreign policy establishment, whatever we want to call them, one of the ways they manufacture consent is by sowing deep misunderstanding of world politics. And the primary form of that is a deep misunderstanding of the parts of the world, the nations and the people that are targets of empire, that are the ones who are facing the uh, wrath of an empire that wants to expand and maintain its grip on world dominance. And so my hope through the work that I do is not just to help people understand, well, why is the United States so committed to a full throttle war in Ukraine? Or why is the United States so committed to militarizing the Asia Pacific against China, but also to help people understand China and Russia and the multipolar world that's emerging. Because if we don't understand these countries, if we don't understand what their people and what their governments and what their um, institutions are trying to build, then we truly actually can't forge a path toward peace because we will simply and this is very easy in the United States, which is arguably the most selfish and narcissistic country to ever exist in human history. It is very easy to go along the path of looking at how any kind of development, especially even peace, could just benefit the United States. But in retrospect, we need to view ourselves as part of a world community, as part of this multipolar world as equals. Uh, when I was in China, in July of 2023, I spoke with the brother of the former foreign minister of China, Yang Jiexi. His name is Yang uh, Jiemian. And he said to me, the United States needs to be just another country. And I believe that Americans need to be just another people. And the United States needs to be just another country. It needs to be, it needs to behave and it needs to operate in the world as an equal to all others. But we can't get there unless we truly understand uh, the sides of the story that we don't not only know get to hear about, but are constantly demonized. These sides that are considered adversaries, uh, the uh, Russian side, the Chinese side, the Iranian side. This comes with consequences, too, because now we are seeing a huge crackdown on information that is deemed uh, Russian propaganda, Iranian propaganda, Chinese propaganda. Uh, we see Hillary Clinton, uh, the uh, totally unpopular uh, failed presidential candidate of 2016 and 2008, uh, she, you know this this arch neocon and establishment hawk t talking about the need to imprison people for spreading misinformation that uh, aligns with the Russian line. We've seen this actually occur where you have Scott Ritter's house raided by the FBI. You have the Uhuru Three in Florida convicted of conspiracy to. Uh, you know, to operate as a foreign agent. You know, all these attempts to silence critics of U.S. foreign policy are deeply built uh, on and rest upon this misunderstanding that we have in the United States of the world. And so that is my mission, truly, uh, is to deepen people's understanding. It is not 
uh, as much as I may agree and align with Russia and China's uh, foreign policies, it is not simply to just say I agree with those foreign policies, but it's to get people to understand why these foreign policies are different and how uh, they relate to this uh, deeply changing world that we are engaging and witnessing right now. I don't think for me, there's nothing more important because I think everything else flows from that, even the improvement of people's lives in the United States, even all these kind of niche issues that have catastrophic consequences like uh, what's happening to the natural environment in the world, all of it, right? You, you really can't uh, address without uh, a fundamental change in world politics. Yeah, you know, you can put it like this. Peace is not everything, but everything is nothing without it. Because, I mean, if you bomb each other to smithereens, there's just not much you can do about the environment, for instance. But the... I, I very much align with what you're saying. The the one of the core problems that we have of the why the war machine is able to continuously produce more war is that it is able to capture entire populations and the imagination and understanding of populations of what is happening in world affairs. And a lot of it is built around very dumb narratives, really just dumb. And it gets as dumb as good versus evil, right? Anyone who's not on our side is evil and inspired by evil. And because we are good, we need to go and bomb them and liberate <laughs> liberate local people to the point where George Bush Jr. was surprised that the Iraqis didn't, didn't uh, welcome him with waving flags. But that one aside, the issue that in this information space we have is that the narrative itself is quite fact resistant. You can throw as many facts as you want at it. It's just kind of it goes away and people then say call that Russian talking points. At some point, I wish Vladimir Putin stood in front of the camera and said two plus two is four, which would make our whole mathematical models Putin propaganda and it would have to be rejected. Why? How do you explain to yourself that it is so that it is that the narratives that especially the neocons and so on create are so powerful um, apart from, or is it just the media power or are there other mechanisms going on in order to sell this stupid version of reality, which we try to kind of correct? It certainly goes beyond uh, the Western mainstream media. Western mainstream media plays a huge role and uh, it can't be understated, even if you have this interesting dichotomy where you have public opinion toward Russia, China, and Iran consistently, DPRK, or any country that's in the crosshairs of U.S. foreign policy. Generally, you find in the United States and in the broader collective West, too, a deep uh, plunge of public favorability, meaning that most of these countries are viewed very unfavorably. And we've seen, especially with China, that increased dramatically over the past eight or so years. And you also have this dynamic where people in the United States actually distrust the Western mainstream media uh, more and more and more <laughs> with each passing year uh, to the point where it's one of the least trusted institutions actually uh, for Americans. So you have this interesting dichotomy where there is a lessening trust in the Western mainstream media, but yet the narratives that it promotes are are still effective at the foreign policy realm. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. And it's not just that, of course, whether they turn on their streaming apps, television, watch their favorite TV show, or they uh, read the New York Times or watch the 24-hour news cycle with one of the big uh, five or six uh, monopoly media monopolies uh, promoting uh, neocon foreign policy talking points and the neocons that are giving the talking points. Uh, there's also a lot more to it. And one... Uh, or many of these facets are less paid attention to. Uh, uh, we need to look at, of course, just the the actual position that the United States has found itself in historically and how that has developed. Um, there hasn't been a time in U.S. history, really, where the United States viewed itself outside of the realm of empire. Uh, you had Thomas Jefferson uh, very early on in the formation of the United States, saying that the United States needed to be an empire of liberty, 
meaning that it needed to spread its wings all around the world and give liberty to everyone else. And then you had that foreign policy be enacted, especially initially in westward expansion on the North American continent, but also southward expansion across Latin America and South America. Uh, and that, uh, through the Monroe Doctrine, was really the beginning of the U.S. of, of U.S. foreign policy in the U.S. empire. And so that's continued, and it reached an apex during the uh, period directly after World War II, where the United States intentionally maneuvered during that incredibly destructive conflict and maneuvered itself into the top hegemonic status, the economic superpower in the world and the military superpower it was doing it simultaneously as Europe was getting torn apart. And of course, as Soviet Union and the Chinese were doing most of the dying and liberating, uh, they were the ones who defeated uh, the, uh, Japan and Nazi Germany. It was they who gave the most sacrifices. And if you ever travel to Russia, I've never been to Russia, but I've been to China, China several times. And you know just how uh, in, uh, incredible uh, the sacrifice was for the Chinese people. It was uh, nearly 20 million people. And the Soviet yeah. Union was nearly 30 million people. So that were killed uh, in order to liberate the world from fascism. So the United States maneuvered itself to not incur those losses and also not to do uh, as much of the fighting on that front. And uh, its military prowess and economic prowess is owed to that approach. And so after that, the United States spent an inordinate amount of resources in promoting itself as the most exceptional country to ever exist at a particular point in history. It had always done this, but now it was doing so as a top superpower and spreading this message all across the world and sending very intense messages in many different ways, not just in propaganda, not just in the Cold War, which made communism and anyone who affiliated or looked like or sounded like a communist. Uh, there were many people who were not communists at all who were part of the what is now known as the McCarthyist witch hunt during that period. But there was an intense, intense propaganda messaging through the media, as well as through policies, very strict policies strict policies in labor unions, for example. Uh, many labor unions still force people to sign cards saying they won't join the Communist Party of the United States, which now the Communist Party of the United States is really not much. But that was a message sent to workers that there would be punishment. You wouldn't get union benefits if you didn't sign these cards. Uh, then you, of course, had the intense repression that went far beyond just the HUAC hearings that a lot of people know about where people were accused of being spies of the Soviet Union or working for China. It was it's a lot deeper than that. There was intense campaigns to silence anyone who was critical of the United States's uh, position as an empire. You had people like Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois literally either exiled or, uh, you know, ruined their careers ruined in order to silence them. And you had people executed as well for these crimes. So that intense anti-communism and really what it was, was a war on the movement for independence worldwide. That had a huge impact on U.S. consciousness, on the way that people in the United States view themselves. Uh, to this day, People in the United States view themselves, no matter how bad their conditions get, they've been told that they are better than everywhere else and that anywhere else that is attempting to develop a different system and maybe get their way out of the miserable conditions that especially foreign, Western, and even American occupiers and invaders have wrought to them, they're told that they are bad. Now, not only are they bad, they're evil, they're strange, right? The DPRK, the hermit kingdom right it's called china with its uh you know it has uh you know spies everywhere their their social credit scores uh you know russia right russia is this uh dystopian uh 
uh, you know, nightmare where it's ruled by one person, Putin. Like, uh, as you said, there are these dumb narratives, but these narratives come from a place of exceptionalism. This idea that the United States is and always will be the top superpower. When that happened beginning after 1945, the United States politically, economically, militarily, and in terms of the information war did everything possible to ensure that people believed that of themselves to the point where people who are fighting for maybe better human rights, civil rights, political rights, economic rights, uh, they had to battle amongst themselves and contest amongst themselves this debate, right? This debate about this narrative about the rest of the world, because really what the United States is always worried about, uh, the U.S. elite, I should say, the ruling elite, uh, the foreign policy establishment, they're not just worried about whether Russia, China, whether any country in the world is going to be more independent, more sovereign, and maybe build an alternative order. They're worried about people in the United States, people in the collective West, wondering about what they could do. Uh, that was actually one of the biggest reasons why the golden age of American capitalism ever occurred. It wasn't just because workers went on strike and mass. That was definitely part of it. But it was also because there was a big fear that the Soviet Union was doing things like giving health care to people and educating people, uh, giving uh, these things out for free. Right. And uh, that there was this massive industrialization campaign and things were quality of life was moving at a breakneck pace that maybe just maybe people would want even more than what they were getting, the crumbs that they were getting from their employers, that perhaps they would want more power to uh, determine what life was like in the United States uh, and what life should be and what kind of lives are actually dignified. That was really the fear, right? The fear was that there would be a widespread uh, adoption of more humanitarian and dare I say socialist policies that made it so it was really important to ensure that there's always this huge divide inside of American and Western societies that people are always wondering, hmm, well, if we're more like the Chinese and more like the Russians, then, ooh, that's bad and we must uh, do the opposite. Well, the opposite tends to be political and economic suicide, but that's the point, right? That's the point is to get people more embracing uh, very reactionary, very counterproductive policies. And so today we have a similar situation where you do have China, you do have Russia, you do have Iran, you do have a lot of countries leading the way in developing a new system independent of U.S. finance and U.S. militarism. And we are constantly being told that this path is destructive that this path is actually one that's about empire in and of itself right china's building an empire russia wants to take over europe iran uh they just want to build up all these proxies and rule over the region and and you know completely destroy quote-unquote democracy like this <laughs> is the way that they talk about it because they don't want people in the collective west and the united states wondering well, should we be behaving like this around the world? And if we're not behaving like this around the world, well, what kind of world do we want? And guess what? China, Russia, these countries, they have ideas about what uh, the world should look like. A lot of them actually happen to just be in the UN charter. <laughs> so we could all find these ideas. But uh, there is a fear that, you know, perhaps especially with uh, the genocide happening in Gaza, especially with this forever war in Ukraine that could go nuclear, more and more people are going to wonder, well, what kind of world do we actually want to live in when the world that we live in right now is so fraught with risk and conflict and potentially uh, human humanity eliminating nuclear uh, conflict? How much of it is projection? You know, there's a lot of of fears about the outside and about the world and about China taking over and Russia taking over and and these things coming for us and we need to defend we need to hold the light in Vietnam right that was literally the the whole rationale the domino theory we need to hold it there or we need to be in the South China Sea now how much of that is projection because it is pretty clear to these elites that that's exactly what 
they are doing to the others, right? I mean, they do these regime change operations, right? They encourage color revolutions. They try to topple governments. And then vice versa, those are the people who, who scream the loudest, Russia gate, Russia gate. They're trying to influence us. Right. They're meddling. And, and we have this in several, I mean, also in the military realm, the, the, the US keeps saying we cannot allow China to have a blue water Navy because we have a blue water navy and we're in front of their of their coasts. So is this actually is the US reading itself, its own actions into those of the others, or at least projecting them for political purposes? Definitely. And it has to. I mean, it has to do that. Because if it doesn't, then the entire basis of the militarization that you refer to, the wars that you refer to, uh, are completely bunk they don't make any sense unless china is truly an aggressor right unless it is truly uh building a massive military to confront uh take over taiwan these kind of things unless unless russia is building its military industrial complex up to the point where it can take over the rest of eastern europe and rebuild the the russian empire of uh, pre-soviet days like unless you can promote that narrative then why why are you doing what you're doing that's the big question why is the united states doing what it's doing why is nato doing what it's doing well you can't just say for democracy right because nobody really knows what that means uh that's not that's that's something that's been promoted for decades and decades and decades now and it only gets less and less convincing the longer that it is promoted so there has to be a threat right there has to be this idea that there is a threat and this is the contradiction of american exceptionalism because the united states as an empire has promoted itself as an empire of liberty like thomas jefferson an empire of democracy an empire that's benevolent an empire that's good for the world because when you know you hear antony blinken say it all the time the world needs the United States to be the leader of this rules-based order because the United States is the one that it is uh, that keeps things stable. Blah blah blah. Right? All this nonsense. It, it's just it's it's complete and utter BS. It's it's all just the worst kind of lies. Uh, but that has to also exist with the threat to this because if you're unless you have that threat then people will might begin questioning the legitimacy of your claims about yourself. So a lot of this projection, a lot of this making evil out of the rest of the world that is maybe being competitive with the United States or in the collective West, or maybe even just charting a different path, whether they care about competition or not. Right? Because I, I truly don't think for example, Venezuela is really, I don't think, I don't think the PSUV or Nicolas Maduro cares about competing with the United States, right? They are in a really dire economic situation. They're just trying to get out of sanctions and figure out how to not be uh, uh, as poor as they've been, uh, as they've been forced to be because of U.S. sanctions. And even China, China, of course, uh, would love to compete with the United States around technology and all of this high value added goods and industrialization and moving toward, you know, this fourth industrial revolution, all of this stuff. It wants to be advanced, but at the same time, it is not basing its political and economic trajectory on the United States' fate. Does it, it, the United States does yeah. can do what it wants. It can compete, it can progress or it can regress, but China is going to continue to do what it does. So, uh, this evil that we are told about China and Russia, Iran and the multipolar world, it really truly is about um, uh, uh, creating this uh, narrative that can justify these reckless policies of dismemberment and war and containment while also getting people in the collective West in the United States to look away from the internal contradictions of their own societies. Because if you just call yourself a democracy that is doing good all over the world, people might ask the question, well, how are you doing that? But they'll ask that question less if they truly believe that there is something more threatening 
to their existence than that of the policy of their government, the foreign policy of their government. And that is why it is so important that uh, not only that these narratives justify the policy, the F U.S. foreign policy and the foreign policy of its collective West uh, vassals, but also that people are convinced that there is this kind of black and white contrast between uh, uh, the U.S. as the kind of uh, exceptional state and uh, its adversaries, which are seen as like this axis of evil. So that is really why there is all of this projection that occurs. So, I, yeah. I, I'm just so fascinated that overall, you know, whatever we think of U.S. foreign policy and, and of the way they, of what the U.S. does, the fact that it is able to do this is pretty amazing, not I'm not a fan of it, but it's amazing that it's possible <laughs> yeah, it to do that. Because if you think about it, you know, in the Vietnam War, the Amer America still had to fight its own proxy war, right? Your dad was there, boot on the ground, right? Um, they don't need to do that with Ukraine anymore. So they figured out to fight a proxy war completely without their their own uh, their own soldiers, while the other side has to conscript their own people. Um, at the same time, you have you have glaring contradictions like the this idea of um, liberty, democracy for everybody and heaven on earth, while the US is a highly unequal society and a lot of people live under the poverty line. <laughs> um, yeah. the, the You have that problem. Uh, I, you have the issue, the, another contradiction that there's infinite money for Ukraine, infinite money for war, infinite money for, for weapons, and there's never money <laughs> to fix the bridges <laughs> or to to uh for 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 social benefits inside the US and somehow this still this still works and even in foreign policy you have moments which are mind boggling to me like 2023 last year when joe biden was so overjoyed of shaking the hand with the with the vietnamese and saying like we are now strategic allies with the vietnamese and it's like that's north vietnam that's literally the, the regime that you fought a bloody war with like 50 years 50 years ago and now you're shaking their hands the guy who was shaking hands on the other side was literally in the trenches against the americans but the vietnamese are smart enough to play with everybody um and of course vietnam is still a communist regime the same actually or a very not the same but a similar communist regime to what china has and there it doesn't matter and the narrative is able to completely utterly disregard these glaring contradictions how do you think why is the narrative able to do that and sell this to the people hmm. well if you just even look at something like what's happening in west asia and in gaza uh, you can see that even when the uh, people of the united states are aroused in in rage because uh, there is a mass rage right here about this uh, people are unhappy uh majority of people actually in the united states are unhappy with U.S. foreign policy in West Asia and in Gaza, I mean, most people see it as completely complicit and fundamentally involved in what is uh, maybe the most open, openly viewed and widely <laughs> digested for human consumption in terms of media uh, genocide we've ever seen. So that in and of itself is interesting because that rage, that uh, even just the protesting, right? There was mass, there's been massive protests all across the US and all across the West too. Yet it doesn't do anything. The United States has not changed its behaviors and US politicians have not changed their behavior. The US foreign policy establishment has not even blinked at potentially stopping <laughs> this behavior. And that dynamic, I believe, is fundamentally why this is able to continue to happen why the u.s can do what it does it can be this hypocritical really joke of the world now it's it's quite clear that a, a good portion of the world and a growing portion of the world uh, not just view the united states as dangerous but they view it as uh not serious right how can a country be serious how can a a a, a nation that says that it is the uh, leader of the free world be taken seriously when it is backing what Israel is doing, when it is contemplating 
long range missile strikes on Russia via its proxy in Ukraine, which Russia continuously says would be a direct confrontation and lead to a direct war, which then would probably lead to nuclear war. Like, like how could a how could a governing system be taken seriously when it is doing these things? Uh, but nonetheless, it can continue to do these things because on the one hand, you have a world situation which is still figuring out. You have a multipolar order which is still developing, emerging, and not at the point where it can uh, necessarily uh, completely detach itself from the uh, world economic and political order that the United States essentially, I won't say built, but essentially has dominated uh, because this order is centuries in the making of uh, Western imperialism and, and colonialism. But nonetheless, it is dominating it and it's difficult to detach yourself from that. But on the other hand, you have a situation where people in the collective West and the, in the United States in particular uh, are not yet at the point where they have decided that this contradiction between what they want and what their government is doing is enough for them to uh, change that situation. There are certainly people who are at that place. And I think what's happened in Gaza and also Ukraine has moved a lot of people in the direction of wanting to see fundamental change. But uh, there isn't a clear cut and articulate political movement that is powerful enough to say, oh, this is how it should be done. Right. And so that's why you have all kinds of instances where a lot of energy might be burned through a Trump campaign or a Bernie Sanders campaign or some kind of a protest movement, but it doesn't generally lead to any kind of changes because the U.S. establishment can look at it and say, well, Trump is going to work out for us anyway. Well, we can decapitate Bernie Sanders. He's, he's not really uh, that courageous anyway. And all oh, these protest movements, they're not really calling for anything fundamental or specific. And they're not really working toward it because they're just not at that place. So that contradiction is one that Americans and I think West people in the West fundamentally, because I think this is a dynamic that is increasingly true in the West, are going to have to deal with <laughs> this contradiction between what they fundamentally want and what their governments are doing. On the other hand, though, I think on, on the positive note, we see that the world situation, while it is still very much in birth, that moments like what uh, policies, I should say, wars, conflicts like Ukraine, like Gaza, can rapidly speed up the development of something that in years prior would have been looked at as a multi-decade process. Now we're looking at the emergence and the solidification of a multipolar world being potentially a years-long process, right, uh, uh, mm -hmm. spanning several years. But before 2022... Something like BRICS, something like multipolarity was seen as, well, this is long term. Maybe it will be fundamentally achievable when China becomes the biggest economy in GDP terms uh, in 2040, 2050, you know. But now we're talking about, well, it's 2024 and who knows where we'll be in 2030, right? Like in six years, what will be the state of the American empire? What will be the state of this so-called rules-based order? It is very tenuous and fraught. And the reason for this is because uh, crossing that red line in Ukraine, allowing the devastation and genocide in Gaza to occur uh, and to uh, support it fundamentally, all of that has led just those two flashpoints alone have led to seismic changes worldwide, which uh, are now unstoppable. You can't roll them back, right? The, the axis of resistance is only going to continue. There's, there's no peacetime for Israel, the United States, and West Asia. There's no social peace even or stability. You'll never see that again. You're always going to see conflict. I don't think there's ever going to be a time where you can say, well, Israel and Hezbollah, Israel and Iran, Israel 
and the resistance uh they're not fighting anymore i don't see that <laughs> i don't see that changing until there is something that determines that changing like one of them is going to be defeated and it looks like it's going to be the israeli side uh on the other hand in ukraine right it's like yeah. i there's no hope for a peace deal because uh ukraine is absolutely existential to this larger foreign policy of ensuring that there is no power that can compete with the united states and given that we're not only going to not see peace but you can't undo what this conflict has brought about which is not only acceleration of multipolarity but the defeat of nato like nato it, no matter what it does it's going to lose it continues to escalate in ukraine more ukrainians will die they will lose every they won't just lose the territory that they've already lost but they'll lose more and more and more uh, on, on all levels if they pull back that's just that's what is that that's defeat <laughs> so there really is no victory in any of these conflicts anymore and i think that's where there can be something positive coming out of this a historic moment where uh, uh, we we can't necessarily predict how fast uh, a multipolar world will uh, be solidified, but we know that at any given moment, U.S.-led foreign policy will speed it up dramatically. And while that usually comes with a lot of problems and issues, for example, like we've had to witness the mass displacement and <laughs> dismemberment and genocide of, of the Palestinian people. It also leads to new horizons for people to not just resist, but also to build something better. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing worldwide right now. We're seeing the, countries and people try to build something better than what exists now. The, the, the risk, of course, and maybe we, we go towards like ending with this one, um, is that if you can roll it back, you flatten it and that's the danger yeah. i see which is like yeah. okay if we can't roll it back then a global samson strategy we burn it mm. all or we go all the way out and have a third world war maybe even nuclear mm. how much how afraid are you of the us of the decision makers certain decision makers in the us maybe including in israel taking the decision all or nothing yeah. and if it's nothing it's nothing for everybody how 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 high yeah. do you do chan do, do you think these chances are well it's hard to measure because there is this in unpredictability factor but at the same time i think uh, there's there's two actually two answers to this on the one hand at this very moment it is both high and low. Uh, it is high in the sense that uh, the empire is very desperate. The United States as an empire is very desperate. It, there are significant sections of it, decision makers, elites, that uh, do not want to see any semblance of its hegemony and of their hegemony uh, be rolled back. And so uh, they're willing to do anything, right? You have guys like uh, Al, uh, the Alex Karp of the Palantir Corporation writing uh, op-eds about a three-front war is not only necessary, but damn good, right? This is a guy whose corporation is responsible for taking GPS of, uh, for Israel to you know, murder Palestinian civilians. So you have people like this indeed right these these powerful forces who uh, own major corporations they tend to mostly be in the defense sector uh in the military industrial complex that surely are licking their chops at the profits that can be gained from building up toward war with russia with china with iran that's indeed uh the case on the other hand you met you articulated it quite well that everyone, if if uh, the United States can't win, then nobody will win. Everyone dies. Essentially, everyone goes down with the ship. And that means that the entire ship, the planet, uh, the ability for human life to live on it is eradicated. And that means you, you can't have this uh, profit-driven 
uh, system of empire that uh, uh, that is dependent upon a few people exploiting and, and destroying the lives of many that doesn't exist anymore. And so with that, you will see, and I think that's why we see this grating. It almost feels like tectonic plates, like rubbing up against each other. You have these two kind of contending uh, contra- you have this contending contradiction, these two contending forces at play where you have on the one hand, this desperate need to uh, accelerate this process of stopping China, stopping Russia, because if you don't stop them, then uh, there's the meme, right? You see over social media, uh, like Chad, Xi Jinping, uh, Xi Jinping, and it's like, do nothing and, and win, right? Like that will happen. China will rise. China will become the biggest economy. China will become and already is in many ways the technological powerhouse of the world, the, the center of innovation, and also the center of multipolarity. Along, and Russia will also be able to develop along its own path toward those ends if it's left to its own device. Like, like that will just happen. And so you have this those those tectonic plates rubbing up against each other, leading to this very haphazard and what a lot of people say is like unstrategic. A lot of people, a lot of geopolitical analysts will talk about it. this is not strategic. Well, it can look like it's not strategic and 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 definitely uh, be shown as non strategic because it's hard to devise a strategy when on the one hand you need to go to wars that everyone loses. Uh, you need to conduct wars that everyone loses or you need to uh, fight a kind of and wage a kind of steady, slow rolling uh, uh, policy of containment, which doesn't reap the benefits that you want. But at the same time, uh, uh, the alternative to that means that uh, the multipolar world and the leaders of it get to rise and accelerate their rise to an even greater degree. So it really is a situation where the United States finds itself really backed into a corner, really of its own making. But uh, uh, there are times where people describe this phenomenon as the U.S. kind of shooting itself in the foot, uh, uh, bringing the world closer together uh, in in isolating the United States and moving toward a multipolar world. But truly... This was always going to be the path. There's, there is no. I'm trying to articulate that there is no. Well, it could be done a different way. No, no. Under the current arrangement, there is no different way. They say it to us. They tell us. They said after the fall of the Soviet Union, there is no alternative. They called it Tina. They say you made a little fun acronym out of it. Francis Fukuyama said this is the end of history. There is no other way. Everyone is going to fall in line, and if you don't. Well, you're going to end up like X, Y, and Z country that, you know, after 1991 uh, saw themselves dismembered, uh, uh, decapitated, Yugoslavia, Iraq, we can go on and on and on, Libya, and later on, Ukraine, you know, we can go on and on and on. But the point here is that the, uh, 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 the overall trajectory uh, of the U.S. empire is toward World War III. So it is indeed a high likelihood because its overall strategy for maintaining dominance inevitably leads us there. How fast we get there is a question because there are a lot. Of, I'm, I, you know, I don't know these people, but I can tell by the way they talk about it, if you read the Financial Times or things like that that are frightened by a nuclear mushroom cloud igniting somewhere in the world, uh, possibly the United States being the ones to use it first because the United States is the most likely to do so. And that leading to a cascade effect where the entire world economy is blown to smithereens. And guess what? The ability to live on the planet is too for human beings. There are people who are scared of that. They don't tend to influence policy very much though, because they still enjoy and want to profit from the overall 
policy of the United States. They will, it, they don't believe that peace is profitable either. So what they do is they just kind of sit right. on their hands and say, "Hey, okay, this is gonna, you know, we, we, it's not like we see someone like Bill Gates or, uh, you know, any of these people will be like, oh yeah, maybe we need peace. Even Elon Musk, right, has huge investments in China, although his Tesla is." I've been to China several times. It's quite clear that his Tesla is way behind other Chinese EV uh, competitors. But at the same time, you would think, hey, Elon, you should probably be more of a stalwart of peace with China. He he isn't. He he's he's too focused on Israel. He loves yeah. what Israel is doing. He's yeah. more concerned about your position on Gaza and what you're saying on X than he is about his investments in China. And that is why the most the loudest and most influential sectors of U.S. foreign policy tend to be the company men and, of course, the government officials they hire who are the most aggressive. So uh, uh, this what we are in really is a balancing act that people we shouldn't trust or allow to have that power. That's what they're doing. They're 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 tip. They're weighing the scales of whether a world war is worth the trouble. They're constantly poking Russia to see, hey, how close can we get to uh, a nuclear war without actually igniting it? Because, hey, maybe there's some other thing we can do because Ukraine is done. We can't do anything about that anymore. There's no change that's going to happen there. But we need to do something else eventually. So how much can we poke Russia to see if Russia will just allow us to do this. And they do the same with China. Uh, they're doing it with Iran. Uh, uh, they're wondering how uh, much they can get away with before there is an actual cataclysmic conflict among big powers that could very well either go nuclear or lead to a – like you know, in the case of Iran, for example, such a destructive conflict that, uh, yeah, you might see – uh, uh, Israel actually pull out those secret nuclear weapons that we're talking about because they just can't handle what is coming their way. So I think in terms of World War III, we are in a position of uh, 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 it makes sense to believe that, yeah, and perhaps it is years away. Maybe it's not going to happen tomorrow or 2025. But I think there's reason to be very concerned that it is it it's going to happen in our lifetime and the lifetime of many people if this trajectory that the United States is on continues. I, I think that has to be uh, very much uh, uh, the understanding that people everywhere have, and I think there is a growing understanding of this worldwide. Unfortunately, in the collective West, the U.S. in particular. That understanding is probably not where it needs to be. I do hope that we can contribute to the understanding of the need for de-escalation and sane yes. policy. Danny Haifong, people should find you on your YouTube channel mainly, right? Um, under your name, yes. Danny Haifong. Any other place to find yes. your work? Uh, sure. You know, if you uh, want to first, uh, if you want to follow me, you can follow on Telegram, for example, t.me slash Danny Haifong. X. I'm also just Danny Haifong, so I'm pretty easy to find as well there. Rumble, you can find me at Danny Haifong, just in case YouTube uh, uh, takes people like you and me out. Uh, we have that alternative. And then, um, yeah, if you want to support my work financially, you know, you can go to my YouTube channel and find the membership page. You can also go to the video description of any of my videos and find things like uh, Patreon, Substack, uh, where um, I do, you know, paid memberships. So if you want to uh, support my work, those are the best places to do it. Um, but yeah, this was great. And thanks so much for uh, this conversation. Thank you, Danny, for all the insight into your thinking. I really appreciated it. And we talk again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.